we've got a ton of hot topics to dive into. CD Projekt Red's CEO is clapping back at wild claims that the studio is in dire trouble because it's supposedly too woke. Seriously, you won't believe this one. We'll break down what's really going on and why the studio is hitting back against misinformation. Then we're taking a look at GTA 6 and how Rockstar might take some lessons from GTA 5's online modes, but there's one mechanic they really need to scrap. Plus, Activision is making waves again, this time with Black Ops 6, as the campaign will require an internet connection but won't need Game Pass Core or PS Plus on console. Yeah, we're going to unpack that. Also, if you're still wondering whether the Red Dead Redemption Steam release is worth the wait, we've got a breakdown on how it stacks up against the PS5 version in terms of graphics. Black Myth Wukong being one of the most downloaded games on PS5, and why live service shooter The First Descendant lost a staggering 87% of its players in just three months. There's a lot to cover, so let's jump right into it. But first, question of the day. Believe it or not, this is my favorite part of the video. I always love hearing and learning from you because sometimes you give me a fresh perspective. So the question of the day is, what is your game of the year? For me, it's definitely Black Myth Wukong. I haven't even finished it yet. Not because I can't or don't have the time, but because I don't want it to end. I'm constantly looking for secret items and hidden boss fights, but that's just me. What about you? What's your favorite game of the year and why? Who knows? Maybe you'll convince me to try out something new. All right, let's get into the first thing I want to talk about today, and that's addressing the PS5 Pro versus RTX 5070 topic from yesterday's video. Believe it or not, I'm not a PC gaming hater. Some of you already know I'm playing and looking into building a powerful rig, postponing the PS5 Pro until GTA 6 comes out. The main reason I want a rig is for better video production, and I also want to develop some apps. Yeah, I'm a geek. I love all tech, and I've loved PC tech ever since I saw someone install Windows 99 with three floppy disks and a CD. Yep, I'm a 90s kid, and I love PlayStation ever since the PlayStation 1 era. Maybe I'll share this story one day with you. Oh, and I won't lie to you, I want to play Red Dead Redemption 2 with some mods and other older games as well. That's the flexibility a strong gaming rig offers compared to a console, but there's a price to pay for that. That's why I always say, for a PC rig to truly be considered superior to the PS5 Pro, it needs to be over $2,000, especially if it's an NVIDIA setup. With that said, let's revisit the PS5 Pro versus RTX 5070 debate with this perspective in mind. When discussing the upcoming NVIDIA RTX 5070, I wasn't really focusing on its performance compared to higher-end models like the 5080 or 5090. Instead, I'm more interested in its price-to-performance ratio. For example, if Nvidia could price the 5070 at $400, it would be an incredible deal, but I know that's probably wishful thinking. Now, there's been some speculation about the 5070 being as powerful as the 4080, but I think that's a bit of a double-edged sword. While the 5070 might hold up in some performance aspects, it could still fall short in certain scenarios due to the fact that it only has 12 gigs of RAM and a 192-bit bandwidth. That could become a bottleneck in more demanding games, especially when compared to the 4080, which has higher specs in these areas. That said, I'm really looking forward to the official reveals from Nvidia, especially since AMD is also releasing their new GPUs around the same time. 2025 is shaping up to be an exciting year for PC hardware. I'm eager to see how everything stacks up and whether Nvidia will justify the pricing of the 5070, particularly with these limitations in mind. In contrast, the PC PS5 Pro is tightly optimized with 16 gigs of GDDR6 memory shared between CPU and GPU and custom hardware, which gives it a smoother performance for its price bracket. You're not getting the flexibility of a PC, but you're getting a more streamlined, reliable performance in a closed ecosystem. With that being said, it's almost impossible to compare a PS5 Pro to these graphics cards as they serve completely different needs. In my opinion, and I might get attacked for this, if you're building an RTX 4090 or even a 5090 rig just for gaming, it's a bit of a waste of money. A 4070 or even a 5070 does the job just fine for most enthusiast-level gaming, especially when you factor in DLSS and other performance-enhancing tricks. We all know about the law of diminishing returns, paying double for a graphics card just to get a 20% boost in FPS or resolution doesn't always make sense. Plus, when you push games to ultra settings, the difference is often so minuscule that you barely notice it. On the other hand, if you're doing hard 
hardcore work like game development or high-end creative tasks, then investing in the best GPUs and CPUs makes a huge difference. Now, bringing it back to the PS5 Pro, this is why it's an amazing piece of tech. You get 4K gaming at 60 FPS with ray tracing, which is exactly what most people want. It's the sweet spot where the console really shines. And I think the price to performance ratio of the PS5 Pro is still acceptable. Of course, things get more complicated in other regions like Europe, where the price can go up to $900. That said, we still have the base PS5, which Sony has confirmed will continue to receive full support. This generation feels different from the PS4 era, where the PS4 really started to feel obsolete after four years. Right now you can get a PS5 for $450 or even $400 in some areas, which is an insane deal for a gaming rig that can push 4K at 60 FPS with ray tracing. Not altogether, of course, but still a great deal. You can't build a PC that matches the PS5's performance at that price point, even today. At the end of the day, it's all about your needs. Arguing over which is superior doesn't really make sense, and I'll admit, I've been guilty of that too. Anyway, that's my take on the whole matter. I hope this clears things up. I'm still a diehard PlayStation fan, but I also love the PC space. And this leads me to my next topic. Why the hate for PlayStation? Here is what one of my subscribers said. Hi Ashley, don't you think it's a bit coincidental that Sony haters, PC fanboys, and Xbox fans are all trying to persuade us not to buy a PS5 Pro? If they're not claiming it's too expensive and suggesting you build a PC instead, they're bringing up the PS6 as if we should wait for better tech. The truth is, the PS5 generation is an eight-year cycle, and the PS5 Pro is a mid-gen upgrade at year four, meant to carry us to the PS6. The PS PS5 Pro is at its most valuable right now, with four years of life left. Life is short, and there's no way console enthusiast gamers are going to stay on the base PS5 and wait another four years for the PS6. Technology is always evolving, and already the PS5 is starting to feel a bit outdated, lacking the advanced tech inside the PS5 Pro. We're looking at a future where game consoles achieve higher performance by optimizing their hardware, rather than relying on the brute force power of expensive PC tech. The base PS5 will struggle as new games take advantage of the latest technology. Forget about the PS6. It's not even part of the current equation. The idea of waiting for it has been planted by haters to convince us not to buy the PS5 Pro. Xbox fans don't have a console that even comes close to the PS5 Pro, and Microsoft is scaling back their console presence, so there's a lot of jealousy fueling their desire to see the PS5 Pro fail. Most PC gamers are still on mid-range rigs, while the PS5 Pro is pushing into high-end PC territory. Sure, the PS5 Pro can't match the best PCs that can brute force their way through games with a 2000 plus price tag, but it surpasses mid-range PCs in the 1000 to 1500 range. So all those lower tier members of the PC master race will soon be invaded by console gamers. To prevent that, they're desperately trying to build a fake PS5 Pro clone with a cheap PC build, hoping to make PS5 Pro sales flop. It's laughable. All PC gamers have a vested interest in the PS5 Pro failing because they benefited from Xbox's failure when all its content got ported to PC on day one. PC gamers want Sony to fail so they can get all the desirable PlayStation exclusives on PC from day one. They're dreamers, and they're totally deluded. These games only exist because of Sony consoles. When it comes to choosing between PS5 Pro and PS5 is hard to choose these days, especially with how some things are over-dramatized on YouTube today. So I want to highlight a question from the audience based on this. And I'm sure a lot of you are in the same situation. So here's the question. And I quote, Since you have experience with the PS5 Pro and know the gaming industry well, I could use your help. I've never owned a console before, and I'm torn between buying the PS5 or the PS5 Pro. I was waiting for the Pro, but it came out at an unexpected price. And without a disk drive. Do you think I should go for the PS5 with the disk version or is the Pro still a better choice, despite the higher price and no disk? Your insight would be really helpful. So many of you know some parts of my story, but if there is ever a time to bring it up again is when I get questions like this. I totally get where you're coming from. My biggest regret when the PS4 Pro came out was choosing the PS4 Slim instead, mainly because it came with three games for the same price. I listened to a lot of YouTubers who downplayed the difference, saying if you didn't have a 4K TV, it wasn't worth it. I didn't even 
even consider the fact that the PS4 Pro offered a 60 FPS mode, so I was stuck with 30 FPS for the entire generation. To make matters worse, when the PS5 launched, I couldn't get my hands on one for two years due to COVID and scalpers. Some people might ask why I didn't just build a gaming PC, but I was traveling a lot for my job in international sales, and I definitely didn't want a bulky gaming laptop. The day I finally got my PS5 was one of the happiest days of my life. Right now, I'm still content with my PS5, but since I'm more stable in one place now, I'm thinking of investing in a PC. So here's my advice. Buy the PS5 Pro if you can afford it. Get a PS Plus Extra subscription, which gives you access to around 700 games, including God of War Ragnarok. I actually have a video with about 60 awesome games included in the PS Plus Extra lineup, and I think it's perfect for a person like you to watch it. I'll link it in the description for you and anyone who wants to watch it. The enhanced games on the Pro are genuinely worth it, like really worth it. If the Pro's price is a concern, wait a couple of months until you have some extra cash to buy a Blu-ray drive. It's not the end of the world. Trust me, if you can afford the Pro, go for it. In just six months, you might find yourself wondering why you didn't just get the Pro in the first place. Money comes and goes, but it's more of a hassle to buy a PS5, change your mind, and then try to sell it to upgrade to the Pro. Please don't make the same mistake I did. All right, so here's the news about CD Projekt Red. Some folks have been spreading claims that the company is going downhill because it's gone too woke. But honestly, that's just part of a bigger trend where some creators profit off stoking unnecessary outrage among gamers. Now, one of CD Projekt Red's CEOs, Michał Nowakowski, actually responded to this nonsense on Twitter. He basically called out these claims as pure conspiracy theories, saying things like, seems we live in times where anyone can record complete nonsense and make a story out of it. Joint CEO Mikhail Nowakowski says on Twitter, quote, tweeting a link to a video making a lot of extreme claims. CDPR talent leaving? We have the lowest rotation of people in recent years. DEI-driven recruitment? We hire based on merit and talent alone, just as we make games driven by artistic vision alone. Why did we choose UE? Because it enables us to work on our games more efficiently and we remain cutting edge tech-wise. The Witcher 3's director left? Well, yeah, more than two years ago. Now, can we stop looking for conspiracy theories and go back to making cool stuff? At the end of the day, CDPR has had its ups and downs. We all remember the rough Cyberpunk 2077 launch, but they've bounced back with big updates and the highly praised Phantom Liberty expansion. There's no sign the company is failing because of any political agenda. In fact, they're working on some big new projects, and it's too early to predict how they'll turn out. What do you think about how studios like CDPR handle these kinds of controversies? Do you think it's better for them to address it head-on like this? The number of active players in Nexon's live service free-to-play shooter, The First Descendant, has fallen by almost an average of 90% since the game's initial release. Meanwhile, fellow free shooter, Once Human is still thriving, and that even had a very similar number of players at launch from around the same time. The First Descendant is by no means quiet, still raking in around 30,000 players a day, but the numbers aren't what they used to be. These statistics are directly from the Steam DB page for The First Descendant, and at first glance they paint a pretty grim picture of the game. Game. Since its release, the player base has been in a steady decline, leading to an average weekly player count of roughly 17,000. While the launch of its first season, Invasion, in August 2024 didn't provide the sort of bump you'd expect to see in a live service game. Let's be real, booty is something we can all appreciate. First Descendants knows this and even your girlfriend can't deny the quality booty in the game. But listen, booty only gets you so far. Once your tank is running on empty, it's time for something deeper, something like democracy. You've got to give some love to the democratic fighters out there the ones holding the line. And let's not forget the female characters. They deserve some spotlight and respect too. Because at the end of the day, every soldier of democracy needs a little boost from that booty energy to keep the fight going. I'm so glad Helldivers 2 didn't go the free-to-play route. It's a great decision. But you know what? Even Helldivers could benefit from a bit of well-placed booty motivation. Am I right? Arrowhead, seriously, hire me for marketing. And remember, no matter what, always booty. Good winter getaway. <laughs> so, Sony's remake of Until Dawn dropped recently, right? You'd think it'd make a splash since it's spooky season and all, but it's been kind of a flop on both PC and PS5. Sony's been pumping out these remakes and remasters lately, like The Last of Us and Horizon Zero Dawn, but this Until Dawn remake feels especially unnecessary. Honestly, it seems like the remake was mostly done to hype up the upcoming movie adaptation, just like they did with The Last of Us Part 1. But in this case, the remake has some pretty annoying performance issues and strange changes from the original 
original PS4 version, which, by the way, you can still play on PS5, so there's not a huge incentive to get the new version, especially when the PS4 one runs at 60 frames per second and costs way less. Player numbers for the Until Dawn remake haven't been great either. On PlayStation, it's got even fewer players than Conquered, which was a huge flop for Sony. On Steam, it only peaked at around 2,600 players, which is tiny compared to the recent PC releases of God of War Ragnarok or Ghost of Tsushima, which had tens of thousands of players at launch. Maybe it'll pick up more players closer to Halloween or when the movie drops next year. But right now, it's not looking great for Sony, especially given all the time and resources they put into this remake. As for Conquered, that game was shut down after just two weeks due to low player numbers. There are rumors it might be relaunched at some point, possibly as a free-to-play game, but nothing's confirmed. There's been some activity on its Steam page though, so maybe Sony has something planned, probably around the time that Amazon's show Secret Level drops, which has an episode based on Conquered's characters. Black Myth Wukong continues to be a solid seller for game science. The action RPG is one of the top downloaded PS5 games for September 2024. In a recent PlayStation blog post, the top downloaded PS5 games for US, Canada, and Europe were revealed. Although Black Myth Wukong dropped a few ranks down from August, it still remains in the top five most downloaded PS5 games. So the new trailer for Ghost of Yoti just dropped, and in just three minutes, Sucker Punch managed to cram in a ton of fascinating details about Japanese history. The game is set 300 years after Ghost of Tsushima and takes place in the Hokkaido region, which back in 1603 was called Izo, and wasn't really considered part of Japan at the time. This period was filled with all kinds of drama. You had Ronin, Samurai Without a Master, and Woku pirates fleeing from the new Tokugawa Shogunate, and the trailer teases a lot of that. It shows burning buildings that look like they belong to the Tokugawa. And we even get a glimpse of conflict between the Matsumai clan, who controlled the region, and the indigenous Ainu people. The Ainu believed that animals like bears and wolves were gods, which plays into some of the imagery we see in the trailer. The main character, Atsu, seems tied to all this. She's got wolf symbols on her gear, which might connect her to the Ainu's wolf god myths. Plus, she's wearing a bearskin cloak, which could hint at her involvement with Ainu rituals. Interestingly, She's also carrying a shamisen, a traditional Japanese instrument, which could mean she's using some sort of subterfuge or has a background linked to the pleasure districts where the instrument was popular. What really stands out to me, though, is the wanted poster for Atsu. It mentions a 100 Ryo bounty for her, which is a pretty hefty sum for that time period. It makes you wonder what she did to get that bounty and what her story is going to be. All in all, I'm super hyped for Ghost of Yote because it's diving into this unique historical setting, blending myth, history, and Sucker Punch's amazing storytelling. I'm curious to see how they'll tie everything together. What do you think? Does the mix of historical drama and myth in the game sound interesting to you? Updated list of games leaving PS Plus Extra Premium in October 2024, as of October 8th. Gungrave Gore's addition to the list of departures brings the total number of games leaving the Extra Premium catalog to 13. Here's the complete list in no particular order. Little Big Planet 3, Gotham Knights, The Evil Within, Ultra Street Fighter 4, Tukiden Kiwami, R-Type Dimensions, a bunch of Dragon Quest games, and Gungrave Gore. All the aforementioned games will be gone by Tuesday, October 15th, when the catalog is updated with new additions. But honestly, I won't be missing any of these games. What do you think? Are there any games on this list that you don't want to leave? So, it's been a long time, 14 years, since Rockstar released Red Dead Redemption, which is a classic action-adventure game set in the American frontier. For a while, it was only only available on older consoles like the PS3 and Xbox 360, but now it's finally being brought to newer platforms. In August 2023, it launched on the PS4 and Nintendo Switch, and soon it will be available on PC. This brings up an important question. Are the improvements in the PC version worth the $50 price tag? So what's new in the PC version? Smooth animations and high quality textures, native 4K resolution, which means everything will look super sharp, support for ultra-wide monitors, and HD DR10 for better colors, cutting edge technology like Nvidia DLSS3 and AMD FSR3 for improved performance. But when they compared screenshots from the PC version to the PS5 version, the differences weren't that huge. That's kind of a letdown, especially for the price they're asking. Also, the system requirements for the PC are pretty high, which is weird for a game that's so old. Some people are worried it might not even look better than Red Dead Redemption 2, which came out a few years ago. If you're thinking about getting it, you might want to shop around for the best deals, especially if you're also interested in RDR2. What do you think about the new PC version? Do you think it'll be worth the money?
Call of Duty Black Ops 6 is dropping on October 25th, and there's an important detail about the campaign mode that just came out. You're gonna need an internet connection to play it. Like, you have to be online for all the modes, including the single-player campaign. Activision said, this is to help deliver better graphics and save some space on your hard drive. They're using this new streaming tech for textures, which means less stuff needs to be downloaded to your console. Instead, some of the content is cycled to an online cache, so it's available when you need it without taking up all your storage. It's kind of a mixed bag though, since it means you can't play offline at all. On the bright side, you won't need a paid subscription to PlayStation Plus or Game Pass Core to play the story mode. So that's a plus. The campaign is set in 1991 during the Gulf War, and it sounds like it's going to have a pretty wild story with a lot of conspiracies. Unlike Modern Warfare 3, they're not doing an early access thing this time. Everyone gets to dive into the game at the same time on launch day, and if you complete the campaign, you'll unlock some rewards for multiplayer, zombies, and other other parts of the game, which is pretty cool. What do you think? Does the always online requirement bother you? Honestly, I think it's total BS. Another reason why gaming is falling. More on this in another day. GTA 6 is the most anticipated game ever, with the initial trailer already setting new world records. The pressure on Rockstar has been immense to deliver something greater than what GTA 5 provided. The hype for the game is undoubtedly there, thanks to the success of GTA 5 and Red Dead Redemption 2 and the 10-year wait for the next GTA. With a reported production cost of $2 billion, GTA 6 is now the most expensive entertainment product ever made, which isn't surprising considering the game entered its first development phase in 2014. There's a lot of excitement about it, especially since GTA Online has been such a massive hit for over a decade. It's expected that GTA 6 will build on that online formula, especially with Vice City being the new setting. But there's one big thing from GTA 5 that they really should change. GTA Online has grown so much since it launched, with tons of missions, properties, jobs, and vehicles for players to enjoy. It's impressive how much content they've added over the years. But one area where it really fell short is the character creation system. In GTA Online, instead of letting you customize your character's look directly, you have to choose your character's parents from a list, and then your character's features are randomly generated from those choices. This makes it super frustrating if you have a specific vision for how you want your character to look, because you end up with a face that might not match your idea at all. A lot of other games have better character creators, and it would be great if GTA 6 could learn from that. They should use a more traditional character creation system, where you can directly customize your character character's appearance, like picking facial features, hair, body type, etc. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, just a straightforward way to design your character would make a huge difference. If they fix this, it would really enhance the online experience and make it easier for players to create the character they want to play as. It's such an important part of the game, and a better character creator could really elevate GTA 6's online mode. What do you think? Would you want to see that change?